You've heard the stories, you've heard the rumors, but is it true? Did Walt Disney really have a home in Disneyland? Well, yes, he most certainly did. And this is the story about the apartment and how it came to be. If you're new to being a Disney fan, you may or may not have heard that Walt Disney himself oversaw the construction of Disneyland, approving or rejecting every little detail that was installed. And his constant tweaking of everything in the park didn't cease until his death 11 years after the park opened. Disneyland isn't just some amusement park, so if that's what you've come to believe, you better just leave those thoughts at the door. Walt set out to create a theme park, a place that was carefully crafted to be the most immersive, detailed, and controlled environment ever brought to the amusement park business. I could go on and on about Walt's concerns with sight lines, research into garbage collection, and even the special effects built into his rides, but that's not what this video is about. Like I said, nothing quite like this had ever been done before, especially on a scale this size. And the only person who truly knew what Disneyland should be, what it should look like, was Walt Disney himself. He dedicated the rest of his life not to his movies, but to Disneyland. That being said, all that dedication to his Anaheim Park meant that it wasn't feasible to drive down from Los Angeles several times a week to keep an eye on his Magic Kingdom. It was sometimes imperative for him to stay close by, and how much closer can you get than inside Disneyland? Walt recognized the importance of a living space for himself at Disneyland early on in the concept phases. He could have easily built his apartment above any shop on Main Street, but he felt that what made the most sense was to have it above the firehouse. You see, it offered views of his beloved Disneyland Railroad. It was in extreme close proximity to Disneyland City Hall, where lots of the park's operations were managed. It was also free from the busy shops on Main Street. And last, but most importantly, Walt always loved the idea of waking up in the morning and sliding down the fire pole the way the firemen used to. The firehouse was one of the first structures to be completed at Disneyland. That way, Walt could inspect the construction progress and give commands and instructions to his Imagineers whenever they had a question only the boss could answer. Walt and his wife Lily loved old Victorian and Edwardian decor and styles. In fact, all of Main Street USA takes place in these two time periods. But while WED Imagineers created the interior designs of Main Street themselves, Walt gave Lillian free reign to design the apartment above the firehouse. Now, let's first take a glimpse at the layout. The only way to enter the apartment is through the door, which is located on the back side of the building accessible by a staircase built only for Walt's apartment. The apartment has one closet, one vanity, one bathroom, one main living area, and an outdoor patio. Disneyland was built on a tight budget, and everything in the apartment had to be as minimalist as possible. Nothing more extravagant than a hotel room. The whole space is approximately 20 feet wide by 25 feet long, making it a 500 square foot space. Once inside the apartment, a short hallway leads you to the closet to your right. Once you pass the closet, you find yourself in the family room. You may notice the prevalence of a certain color, cranberry red, Mrs. Disney's favorite color. With the help of studio set designer Emil Curry, Lillian designed and put together every detail of this apartment, and you'll see a lot of small touches to this room in particular, which makes it economical yet stylish. This room serves multiple purposes as the eating, sleeping, and lounging room. On the back wall is a small kitchenette with a mini fridge, a dish sink, and cabinetry for the wares. Food would have to be cooked in pots and pans over a portable hot plate, but Walt rarely cooked. Instead, you'll see there is a sandwich hot press. Walt was fond of having grilled cheese sandwiches, often with a can of stew or a can of chili. He would also have kept plenty of saltine crackers here. And to wind down at the end of the day, there would have been a decanter of scotch on hand, so Walt could sit back with one of his favorite drinks, a black and white scotch. The whole kitchenette could be tucked out of sight thanks to a set of folding doors. You'll also notice by the hallway window is a chair, a mirror, and a hat rack. Walt often scrambled to find his coat and shoes in the morning, so Mrs. Disney made sure he had a place for both, and a nice chair with which to sit and put on his shoes, and a mirror so he could check his tie on the way out. I know that in the images I'm showing, the furniture is often arranged differently, but I'll get to that later. The room had two rocking chairs. Walt would sit in one of them, listening to his favorite tunes from an antique gramophone and smoking a cigar. 
Lillian could be found sitting in the other one, reading a magazine or book and sipping a cup of tea or coffee. Sitting against the south wall of the apartment is an authentic Regina music box. This one is the Upright Changer Music Box model. It is designed to play chimes and other melodies. You can see two very large, plush red couches. These are interesting because each one can pull out to be used as a full-size bed. And when I say they are pull-out couches, I mean that these didn't unfold. They were simply rolled out from underneath the cabinetry behind the couches. They are solid-built beds. If family was visiting, this room could accommodate Walt and Lily on one bed and Roy and Edna on the other, and their grandkids would sleep on the floor in front of the kitchenette. You'll notice that some of the windows had very long curtains. They didn't exactly fit the length of the windows. The reason is because this apartment had low ceilings due to the fact that the building is designed in 5 8 scale. To make the apartment look a little taller, Lillian had curtains placed that were extra long to give the illusion of height. Today, this is a common practice among interior designers faced with low ceilings. Next, let's move on to the powder room. It probably doesn't need to be said that Lillian would have a vanity separate from the bathroom, so she wouldn't be disturbed if Walt needed to take a shower. Now we move on to the patio stairway. In the 1950s, this is where the fire pole leading downstairs would have stood, but Walt faced issues of guests trying to climb up the pole to get into his apartment, with one person actually succeeding. He forever sealed off the fire pole in the early 1960s with a new stairway leading to a newly created patio on the rooftop of the building next door. The outdoor patio not only overlooked Main Street, but in the early days, it also offered some views of the Jungle Cruise. But the trees eventually grew in, blocking all sight of the attraction. And in a twist of irony, the trees in front of the veranda have also grown in, limiting the view of Main Street. You might be wondering, how on earth did Walt expect to entertain guests, or even his family for that matter, with such a tiny apartment? Well, he asked himself that question too. Originally, the apartment was designed just for Walt, with the idea that he could stay in close proximity to Disneyland on days he had available. And maybe once in a while, Lily or Roy would stay there to enjoy a weekend in the park. But Walt found that more and more, he needed ample space for his family to sleep. Because as Walt and Roy's kids grew up, they wanted to bring their children too. In 1963, work began on building New Orleans Square, an area of the park that would house the park's two most iconic attractions. Most of New Orleans Square was designed with space for upper floors, and Walt insisted on finding use for those spaces, so they didn't go to waste. He had plans to build a private club, as well as a jazz club, and lastly, there was room left over to create a rather spacious apartment for his family. This apartment was designed to have a large bedroom for Walt and Lily, then another large bedroom for Roy and Edna, a living room that could convert to a sleeping space for the grandkids. There would also be an enclosed courtyard for privacy, then a balcony overlooking the Rivers of America, also a large dining room to properly host the family or guests. There would be a proper sized kitchen and pantry and plenty of private bathrooms. And the old apartment on Main Street could be used for either Walt or Roy's family. New Orleans Square opened to the public in 1966, but the apartment above Pirates of the Caribbean hadn't been started on yet. It was just a large empty space. Then, Walt died unexpectedly, and he would never have the chance to complete the new family apartment. For a while, it was difficult for Lillian or even Roy to stay at the apartment on Main Street because it brought back the pain they felt from Walt's passing. The Disney family continued to use the firehouse apartment on occasion, mostly for the benefit of their grandkids. After the death of Walt's brother, company CEO Roy Oliver Disney, the use of the Main Street apartment became less frequent, and Lillian Disney began slowly removing items from it and placing them in storage. Eventually, the company made efforts to preserve the apartment by furnishing it with similar items it used to have, and it was offered more consistently on their guest relations tour schedule, now it remains a carefully maintained and preserved space in the park, available for viewing at a hefty price. The company likes to have its tour guides tell the guests that the apartment's belongings were left just as they were the day Walt Disney died. And you can see why. People then think that they're walking through a moment preserved in time. But that's not quite the truth. Much of the furniture and decorations are not original. They've also changed out the carpet a few times and had to reupholster the furniture due to aging. Also, as legend would have it, someone had plugged in the toaster and somehow created a fire, which was immediately put out by one of the overhead sprinklers. 
The sprinkler had caused water damage to the furniture, the walls, and the floors. Thankfully, the furniture was quickly restored, but other damaged features had to be changed out. As for the space above Pirates of the Caribbean, the Disney company ended up building a luxurious looking art store called the Disney Gallery, and it opened in 1987. I have fond memories of walking up there in the Disney Gallery. It was really a unique experience, especially being able to climb the stairs. The Disney Gallery remained up there until 2007 when Disney converted the space into the Dream Suite. The Dream Suite was meant to be a final realization of Walt's apartment, though all they had to go on were a few art renderings, but I'd say what they created must have been close to what Walt would have wanted. Walt and Lily's bedroom was designed to have two power outlets per wall, because it was said she liked to move furniture often and had difficulty plugging in lamps when the cords didn't reach the outlet. Roy and Edna's room became more of a generalized room, complete with models of Disneyland rides and features. The Dream Suite was available for a free stay to randomly chosen park guests during the Year of a Million Dreams celebration, lasting from 2007 into late 2009. After that, the Dream Suite was mostly abandoned. In late 2018, the Dream Suite was given a minor conversion into a new luxury restaurant called 21 Royal, named after the address for the entry on New Orleans Square's Royal Street. For a price tag of $15,000, you and 11 others can enjoy a meal in the apartment's private dining room, called the Blue Room, and then have access to explore the apartment. Walt's Firehouse apartment can still be accessed for a price cheaper than that, and while you're up there, you may notice a single lamp in the center window, burning bright all through the night. Whenever Walt stayed in the apartment, the cast members would know he was there because, at night, the light would remain on until he went to bed. Some time after his death, a tradition began, one that meant leaving the light on day and night, all year, every year, to signify that even though the man is no longer around, his spirit of hope and imagination is still present, forever burning bright for all those who come to this happy place. <laughs>